Welcome to BIV Today. I'm Tyler Orton. Now we have new research being published this week in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which reveals some really cool innovations emerging from Simon Fraser University. It's what they're calling an information-fueled engine. It's something that was dreamed up 150 years ago, but it was not really previously possible. Joining us today to talk all about this truly unique innovation, it is SFU physics professor John Beck Huffer or Beck Hoover. Uh, John, I just want to thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you. Great to be here. So the first question, like a lot of people might have, they hear the term, you know, information fueled engine, and a lot of them are like, well, what exactly does that mean? So um, we're, we're used to thinking of engines that, that uh, take fuel like gasoline in our cars and then we ignite it and it, it uh, makes it go. And here the idea is, um, it, it, it's the descendant of a thought experiment by uh, uh, Maxwell uh, 150 years ago, who was wondering what would happen if you could see a system that was so small or you could see it so accurately that you could see the little fluctuations because it's jiggling around from the air or the water molecules around it. And could you use that motion, harness it in a way that you could extract work from it, kind of make something go? And so uh, that's the kind of information that we're using. We have a, a, a little bead that's held in a trap and it's in water, but it's very small and we can see it very accurately. So it's just sort of jiggling. And every once in a while it will jiggle up and then we kind of lift up on the trap. And so it's like we're sort of, it's like hanging on a spring and every time it goes up, we can move the support up and we watch it and it's going and then it goes up and then we move it up again. And so we can keep kind of ratcheting it up and produce directed motion or, or it's a heavy bead. We can store the energy that we extract from the bath. Um, it sounds a bit like, like magic. And if that's all that were happening, it would be, of course, you have to pay a price for making it go. So the, the whole apparatus that watches it, that makes decisions and that, that does the moving, that's going to, to uh, cost you more than what you get out of the motion from it. So then you might say, well, why, why is this interesting? And it's because the, 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 the cost is in a different system. So you have one system that's kind of going on its own and then you're paying the cost in, in a completely separate system. And uh, so if this was like a thought experiment 150 years ago, like why is it kind of emerging as something that you guys are able to do now? So you need to be able to um, see very, these are very small particles. So they're about a micron in size. Um, the human hair is about a hundred microns in diameter. So it's, it's a hundredth the, 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 the width of, of, of a, a human hair. And uh, so you need a good microscope and, and a good camera or apparatus to record the motion, a very fast computer to make decisions. So we're making decisions um, 50,000 times a second, and we're, we're watching it and deciding what to do. So none of that was possible until relatively recently, say the last 10 or 20 years. What was it that maybe inspired you and your team to kind of pursue this? Well, we started from, from very much the pure research end that, that here you had these, these thought experiments that kind of underlie our understanding of, of the physics of, of engines and, 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 how they would change if they were smaller and what would be different. And so we were looking for places that, you know, could we test, could we make a very pure version of them? And once we and other groups were able to do that, then your thoughts kind of turned to, well, you know, what can it do? And, and like, if this is an engine, how fast can it go? Can we, can we beat everybody else? And uh, uh, so that was, that was the inspiration for this project. And maybe that kind of leads to some of the next stuff that people are going to be interested in, though. But like, what are the potential applications uh, behind developing this uh, innovation here? Well, I think there there are two broad places that you could you could try to to go with this. One is in the development of of little machines that can can zip around in small small spaces, and um, you could power them in a kind of conventional fashion, or you could power them in this way that sort of takes advantage of fluctuations. And it's not clear just yet what, you know, when one will be better than, than another in this situation. I think we're still a little bit early for that. The other place that you could, you could sort of 
look for applications or wonder whether this is good is to ask, does nature make use of this? We know that inside the cell, there are all sorts of engines and all sorts of things that move bits and pieces of, of, of uh, uh, material around within the cell. It, it doesn't just sit and wander around. There's, there's like little railroad tracks and, and motors that push things along tracks. And the motors that we understand uh, uh, have some of the features of these information engines and some of the kind of more traditional engines. And we're still trying to kind of disentangle, um, you know, what are the design principles of motors on, on such small scales? We understand how to make great engines for racing cars and so forth. But when you, you, you scale everything down to the size of, of uh, objects inside a human cell, then then the physics is a bit different, and and so we're just trying to trying to feel our way around that that space, and and uh, hopefully once we really understand things better, then then we'll see. Okay, yes, it's being used here and for this reason and that, but I think we're still at the state, kind of this intermediate stage where we're exploring. Well, yeah, you said that's early on, so I I'll, I might pepper you with a question or two uh, where you, you might have to defer to the fact that it is still very early on, but do we have kind of a, a grasp on how we might be able to go about, you know, with that scale issue, like did kind of making this applicable to things at, at such a tiny scale. Like I, I'm just thinking about kind of like the process of like manufacturing such a thing. Like, has that been considered in, in much depth at this point? Um, not so much. I mean, our, ours are really impractical for that. So there are our sort of design that we um, are, are, you know, saying we have a, a little bead on a spring. So our spring is actually a, a focused laser beam uh, called an optical trap or optical tweezers. Um, this was something that won the Nobel Prize about, um, I think it was two, two, two or three years ago. Uh, it was invented around 1970 to 1980. Um, and I think it, it, it its trajectory is actually a, that for the instrument is, is, is a good application because uh, uh, of all of this. It started out as just, you know, can light exert forces on particles and then can we use that force to trap something? And then now it's turned into a tool for nanotechnology. We can, we can measure the properties of, of cells, of these motors. Like if you wanna see how strong a motor is, well, you, you, you hold on to one of these beads and then you let the motor pull it and see when it stalls. And so here's something that started as a just pure thought experiment. Does, does light exert forces and ends up being kind of a nanotechnology tool. So with, with the motors that, that we're talking about, we're, as I said, we're still kind of partway in that process. And, and it's always hard to guess what the, you know, the interesting applications are gonna to be too far ahead, I think. So for you and your team, was there like trial and error involved? Like uh, you had to go about uh, making it go from thought experiment to something that was actually existing in kind of our, our practical reality right now? A, a bit of trial and error, but but I was very lucky because I was able to work with uh, uh, my colleague David Sivak here at SFU, who's a theoretical physicist, and so he and his group had been analyzing some of these, and so we worked together. And I think actually it was a very good. It's been a very good collaboration because sometimes they come with ideas and we go off and try them in the lab. Sometimes we are just playing around and say, "Oh, this looks looks like a nice way to do it," and then they go off and say you know, calculate things and say, yes, of course, that was the right way to do it. So we understand why. So there's, there's the, the paper that we published together is a really nice blend of, of uh, experiment and theory. And, and that's been a very uh, a fun process to go through. And this may be kind of a broader issue, though, as well. But when you guys are pursuing this sort of stuff, I mean, how long ago were these experiments taking place? Because I, I, I think about how the pandemic is keeping people away from labs a little bit more, which, which is a very impractical thing for many. Uh, your campus at SFU, I think there's like uh, a lot of people that have to be there for lab work, but there's other people that are, you know, staying out of the classroom. I'm just wondering about how that kind of goes right now when you're trying to do these sorts of experiments. Yeah, well, we so we started these uh, uh, two, two and a half years ago. So before the pandemic, we'd done kind of a first set of experiments, but the the all the final versions have been in the last uh, uh, the last year or so. So we were we were definitely shut down at the beginning of the pandemic and then just nothing happened. And then um, we've been relatively lucky in the sense that um, these are small scale experiments. So uh, Tushar Saha is the one who really was doing the bulk of the experiment or really all the experimental work. And so he was able to, to work um, 
pretty, you know, pretty close to normal. I mean, they, the, the biggest problems we had actually were, you know, something would break and we would have to send it down to California and get it repaired. And that took, you know, months when it would have taken weeks and, and uh, stuff. But yeah, so it was slowed down, but, but, but we were still able to keep going. Is it harder to have kind of that collaborative spirit at times, you know, when you're used to working shoulder to shoulder with uh, folks? Yeah, no, it did. It, it definitely um, has been a learning experience. And, and every time we have some excuse to have at least some subgroup together, you realize, oh, it's just, you know, the, the, there's a richness to in-person collaboration that uh, Zoom is hard to, to, you know, does some of the things, but it's not quite the same. So the research, it was published uh, just this uh, last week. Um, and I guess the next question is, is what comes next as you guys kind of pursue kind of uh, the, the avenues that this could lead to? Well, we're still, so, so, so there's kind of a direct line of research that we're, we're still um, pursuing. For example, in, in doing this, we asked, you know, what's the best, like the fastest that you could go and so forth. And, and we did under fairly idealized conditions. And one of them is that you, you can make measurements that are, are essentially perfect. They're really, really accurate. And in many cases, particularly the biological ones, the, the measurements are likely to be a lot sloppier and noisier. And so we want to understand what are the right strategies to, you, you, you take a hit on performance. If, you're, if your information is not as accurate, then you can't go as fast. But if you're clever, you can, you can take just a little bit of a hit in performance. And we want to kind of explore those trade-offs. Um, ultimately, one of, one of the applications that, that, that we would like to be studying with this is that you can use these systems to make kind of simple models of logic gates and the kind that are used in computers. And as you may know, computer um, operation consume an incredible amount of energy. I think it's, it's kind of on the order of 5%. And, you know, people now are worried about, you know, does Bitcoin, you know, right. does Bitcoin for everything, does that, how much energy and how many data processing centers do you need? And so there's, 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 there's real interest in, in understanding kind of when you do the operations that, that um, uh, make up computations that, that go on inside a computer, what are the minimum possible uh, power requirements? And so that's something where there's been, again, a lot of kind of thought experiments and, and, um, and of course, a lot of work coming from the technological end where you just take the best that you can do now and you're con constantly trying to say, can we arrange things to, to, to use less power? But you can also kind of take a bottom-up approach where you say, you know, can we construct something that might we carry out some very simple logical operation and show, you know, if we want to do it at a certain rate, how much will it cost? And is there a best way to carry that out? So we have some ideas of looking at very simple operations, like how do you erase one bit of a memory and how costly would that be? Um, and, and, and we explored this a little bit in the past where we were doing it very, very slowly to kind of do it in the most efficient way possible. But again, you want to do it quickly as well as cheaply. And so there's that trade-off that we're, we're quite interested in. And, and, and you can explore it in using some of the same kinds of uh, uh, setups that we have for this information engine. Well, excellent. Uh, this is fascinating stuff. And I'm, I'm just curious about like, as we go forward in the, in the years to come, like kind of the applications that will emerge out of this uh, sort of innovative stuff. And it's just, you go from thought exper experiment, you know, 150 years ago to actually seeing it in practical terms at this point. So it, it's very cool to witness. But uh, John, I, I just want to thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Well, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. That is John Beckheffer from uh, SFU. He's a physics professor there. And that is it for the show today. But I am Tyler Orton. And you can go to BIV.com for more stories, more interviews there. We'll be back next week. But in the meantime, I just want to thank everyone for listening.